Hello yet again everyone, this is Bob Martin with the Nautilus Dry Docks and we are continuing our build up of this 177th scale Disney Nautilus model available from www.nautilusdrydocks.com uh, If you've been following along in the other build chapters you'll see that we've gotten to this point uh, all the cosmetic aspects of the boat or most of the cosmetic aspects of the boat are done uh, it's been painted, it's been weathered uh, we're gonna concentrate this build chapter on the functional aspects of the boat. We're gonna start by uh, installing the LED lighting and then we're gonna move on to setting up the watertight cylinder, installing that and setting up the linkages. So thanks for joining me. Let's get started. So like I said, we're gonna start with the installation of the LEDs around the salon area. Now I've got the starboard side completed already. And what we're going to be using is uh, our Nautilus Dry Docks LED lighting set. Uh, these all come pre-wired with the resistors in place. They're good for 6 to 12 volts DC. Um, basically all you need to do is install these, connect the red wires together, the black wires together, hook that up to power and you're good to go. So what I've done in this particular case and what you're going to want to do to all of these LEDs uh, is use a sanding disc or a file to grind the face of the LED flush. So what that is going to do is uh, disperse the light a lot more evenly and what I'll do is I'll show you the difference between uh, a ground and a non-ground LED light. So let's take a look at the difference between that filed and, and non-filed LED in terms of the light dispersion. So what we've got here is the non-ground version and what we've got here is the ground version. So let's get a little bit closer look here. Um, of course, face on, they're fairly equal in terms of light, but once you turn it to the side, you can see that the non-ground version gets much dimmer and the ground version disperses that light a lot more evenly. So that's really what we're after and the reason that we are doing it. So to install the uh, LEDs, it's obviously a very easy um, procedure. I'm just going to pinch these wires together a little bit so they don't catch on the edges of the hole. Uh, and then they just get pressed into place and what I want them to do is protrude from the inside face of that receptacle only about a millimeter at most um, and then what we'll do is use our glue and glue them from the back side to hold them in place. So a very easy installation procedure. I'm going to finish that for this port side uh, and then we'll get into some organization of wiring. Okay, the uh, LEDs are press fit into place. I'm just going to utilize a tiny drop of glue from the back side to secure them in place. And a little bit of accelerator just to make sure that they don't move on me. All right, so the LEDs are now uh, secured in place. They are not going to move anywhere. Now what we're gonna wanna do is fold all of the LEDs inward towards the center of the salon iris. So just press them in until they kind of meet in that center there. And then when they're all together, you're just going to grab all of those wires and twist them to form a spiral. I'm 
just like that. And we're going to continue that through the length of the wires until you end up with like we've got on the other side here. All right, one thing that I like to do is add an LED light in the wheelhouse area shining up from the bottom of the depth tube. That's that clear plastic tube in the center of the wheelhouse. So that's green LED lighting in there right now. And what I want to add is a cool white one shining up from the bottom of the depth tube. So we're going to access that from the inside of the hull. You can see the bottom of that depth tube right here in the bottom of the hull. I've ground that flush on the bottom. Uh, and I've just created a little plastic mounting bracket. It's got a 1 8 hole in it. I'm just going to press fit that LED in there and we're going to glue it directly over top of that um, depth tube and that way when it gets lit the light will shine straight up the plastic tube. Okay as you can see here I have uh, trimmed all of the wire leads to the same length uh, heading to the back. I've connected all of the positive leads and the negative leads for each group together and now what I'm doing is just testing the LED lights in each group to make sure that they're all functional before I proceed with some soldering. So just got a little 12 volt battery here, actually this is a 7 volt battery, but um, connecting it to each one just to make sure that they work. I'm going to do that each one because uh, you can actually, when you're stripping these wires, it's kind of common for one of the leads to break off in these big bundles. So you want to test it now before you go through all the trouble of soldering. All right, we are going to be doing a little bit of soldering now. Uh, got a soldering iron, I've got my liquid flux, I've got my solder here. Um, and what I like to do is just wet the tip of the soldering gun and then place it on the connection to get soldered, wet that down nicely. I really like the liquid flux a lot. Um, it works really well to get things um, nice and clean. So what I'm going to be using here now is this waterproof connector. Uh, it's got ends on it that are already set up for soldering. And uh, what I'm going to do is um, grab some heat shrink and we're going to slip it over these connections, uh, solder it, and then heat it up and uh, make that a nice watertight connection. Alright, the heat shrink that I'm using is a, a dual wall adhesive lined heat shrink and this works really good for waterproof connections. Uh, I've snipped off a couple of one inch pieces, just going to slip it over the wires here. Alright, so we have now got a nice solid connection. I'm going to slip our heat shrink up over each of those ends. And we're going to heat it up with uh, my little torch here. And what will happen is that heat shrink will constrict around the wires there and the adhesive is going to force its way in to the wires. Um, something else that we're going to do is we're going to use some glue and we're going to put it in there. We're going to flood that whole connection uh, in there on both sides with glue uh, so that it is 100% uh, waterproof and we don't rot out any of the connections inside there. Okay, and the last thing that I'm going to do is uh, use this little piece of plastic that I've created. Um, it's just a U-shaped piece of plastic. I'm going to pin down this wire and secure it in place so that uh, if this is ever pulled, uh, it doesn't yank all the LED lights out of place in there. So we'll secure this with some CA and we'll be uh, pretty well ready to go from a lighting perspective. Alright, one final quick test. Uh, I've got the 
lead hooked up to some power here. I'm going to flick the switch on and theoretically all the LEDs should come on at once. There we go. We've got alligator eyes, we've got the wheelhouse interior, we've got the depth tube, we've got all of the floodlights around the exterior. I just want to show you how that depth tube turned out. It's actually pretty cool to see lit up from the inside there. So, on to the next step. Alright, let's move to the business end uh, of the boat. We'll get this all finished up. So you saw in the earlier chapter we had our tilting propeller uh, arrangement set up and now we're going to install the propeller. Now I've got a, uh, a 50 millimeter five bladed brass prop. Um, there's lots of different options out there for you but really what you're looking for is a design that is swept back from that rear face uh, so that when it tilts it does not impact the trailing edge of the rudder right here. So uh, I find that uh, this design works pretty well and then also what works really well is a six or seven bladed scimitar propeller. Um, that's uh, obviously more blades uh, and they're, they're sharper. They look like scimitar swords originating from the hub there. This is going to give tons of, uh, of thrust though. There's lots of uh, area, surface area to push on. The only thing that I've done with this, I've trimmed the face of it so that it's a little bit shorter. And then I've also soldered in a 1 8 inch brass rod to the inside. Uh, so this is all set up as a single piece of brass right now. The other thing you're going to need is a 1 8 brass rod and a little piece of silicone uh, fuel tube from uh, like nitro cars or airplanes. Uh, easily accessible online and dirt cheap. Uh, silicone is the best because it's got lots of stretch to it, uh, lots of give. Uh, and what we're going to do is make a flexible coupling that will allow the propeller to tilt. Now there's not a lot of room back there so we want to make this as uh, compact as possible and to do that I'm just going to slip this tubing over the end of this brass rod something like that now we're going to insert the brass propeller into the back and then feeding this through we're going to slip the silicone tubing over the end and that's going to lock the propeller in place. So I'm going to have to trim this to length so that those two ends, the end of the propeller and the end of the drive shaft, are about just a sixteenth of an inch away from each other and then um, slip it on. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and we'll show you the resulting arrangement. Alright guys, I want to show you yet another backtrack and I'm going to try and go back in the video uh, earlier when we were talking about the uh, universal joint for the tilting propeller mechanism. Uh, during testing here, uh, I've used the, the silicone tubing in the past and it's worked fine, but the more I got to think about it, talking about longevity, um, I prefer to use more of a solid state solution and I've put in a universal joint. You can see it in there. It's a plastic universal joint um, and what that is is a solid mechanical connection between the drive shaft and the propeller. So um, it required a little bit of, of fine tuning on the inside to clear out the resin to allow it to be in there but it wasn't a big deal. Um, if you cut this early enough just hollow it out um, you know large enough to allow the universal joint installation but I just think that's a, a, a smarter solution. Um, the silicone tubing is easier but uh, in the long run I think this is just a better solution. All right, here is the end result. Uh, hopefully you can see it there. You can see I've got flex, just like a, a universal joint would do in there. So that, that trailing edge of that silicone tube is rest up against that brass oil light bushing. That's what keeps the propeller uh, locked in place. Everything is really free moving. It's exactly what we are after.
Okay, what I want to do now is cut my drive shaft to length. And so what we're gonna do in preparation for that, I just set my cylinder uh, in place, making sure that it's seated firmly where it is supposed to be. I've got this brass drive coupler. Uh, we're gonna install that on the back of the cylinder right where it needs to go so that we can get the proper um, adjustment for length. And then what I want to do is mark off my drive shaft at the appropriate length and we're going to need to fabricate uh, a dog bone connector at the back there that'll fit in the socket just like this. So allowing for uh, room for that. We're just going to mark off our drive shaft length. You want to go back about a half an inch from the trailing edge of that drive coupler to get the, the proper length of your drive shaft. So we're going to mark that off, cut our drive shaft to length. We're going to secure that with the set screw and continue on. Okay, what we need to do at this point is build an adapter that'll go from the 1 8 inch drive shaft that we have uh, and scale that up so we can mount our nylon dog bone. And what we're going to need for that are three different sizes of tubing. And fortunately, this is very similar to the tubing that we required for the ram. Uh, we are going to need some 5.30 seconds brass tubing, some 7.30 seconds brass tubing, and some uh, 3 16 brass tubing. And these all nest together like this. So what'll happen is we can just slip our drive shaft in like that and our nylon dog bone in the other end and we've got our coupler. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, I'm not gonna solder this, uh, just so happened I had some aluminum tubing in there and that doesn't like uh, solder as much as the brass does. Um, solder would be the best, but uh, I use red Loctite and that works really, really well uh, as well and it also means you don't have to, uh, to solder. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We'll move on to the next step. All right, here is the completed uh, adapter and just show this to you. So it's uh, just set on the drive shaft right now loosely. You can see that uh, it moves like that. I have not locked it down. Uh, I'm gonna set it in place and set our coupler on the dog bone, drop the cylinder down where it will sit and you want this nylon dog bone to sit about halfway in that slot. Um, that done what we're going to do is mark off the location on the drive shaft itself, remove it, secure it with the Loctite and our drive shaft coupler will be complete. All right, the next step is going to be getting alignment for our um, tilting propeller linkage. And you can see that's the, uh, the linkage right there for the tilting prop. And I'm gonna line this up with the starboard most output for the linkages. So what I've done is uh, aligned the shaft for the tilting propeller linkage with the output shaft of the cylinder and I've gone ahead and marked on that ring, the mounting ring, where that goes through. Uh, you can see that this actually is not in alignment with that uh, shaft. There you go, maybe you can see that now. And um, so what we need to do is drop it down lower, but it's sitting on that ring. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, grind into that ring, mount a little brass guide, uh, get perfect alignment in there, and um, this should be ready to connect our magnetic linkages. All right, here we can see the alignment of these shafts is uh, pretty well bang on. 
and uh, show you the orienting or alignment tube that I put in place. Again, drilled it down, made sure I didn't go through the outer ring there. So that keeps everything all contained and uh, not moving anywhere. So what I want to do now is I'm going to install the magnetic linkages, magnetic linkage connectors here. These are click-ons. This is the old style. I've got a new style uh, as well. They both work equally as good. So um, one thing that I do like to do at this particular point is mark out which pairs match to which so that when I uh, do the other side um, I know which, which magnets go with which magnets. So what we're going to do now, I'm just going to uh, slip this over the linkage end on the cylinder, secure that in place and then we'll be able to take length measurements to attach the other end to our rear section. Alright now when we connect the uh, rear linkage here you need to make sure that you build in some adjustability because um, you're going to want to be able to adjust perfect center trim on that and uh, you don't want to go about rebending linkages every time so what we're going to utilize for that um, is this threaded coupler that allows you to screw the linkage end in and out to make it longer or shorter to get perfect alignment. So in order to get that length you just attach it, uh, set everything in place, mark out your length, cut it, and now what I'm going to do is uh, adhere this again with some Loctite and it'll look something like this when all complete. So again, it very important to have adjustability in all of your linkages in as many points as possible. It makes your life very, very easy when you're doing five tuning a little bit later on. All right, we are moving on to the rear uh, rudder linkages. I've got the brass rod that I done earlier in the build. Um, and what we are going to do now is make some bends so that it will enter into the uh, fake prop shaft, or sorry, prop shroud guide. Um, what I've done is I've just put a little Z-bend uh, in the end of the brass rod here and fed that through the linkage horn. So there's our little Z-bend. And that's just going to feed in like that. And now what you're going to do is make a compound bend that will allow it to jog up and enter into that support. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. All right, guys, here is the completed uh, linkage. You can see it's nice and free moving. It avoids the propeller, which is obviously a very good thing. Uh, I'll try and twist this so you can see the shape. So that's the, the Z-bend that I put in the linkage right there. And to help you out, um, it, at least give you a good place to start, I've got some measurements for you. If you take a look at this fancy diagram that I put together, uh, you can see that the Z-bend uh, goes into the hull goes down at about a 45 degree angle for 18 millimeters, straight back for 12.5 millimeters, and then you've got your little Z-bend in there for the linkage horn. So into the hull, 18 millimeters, 12.5 millimeters into your Z-bend. Now what we're gonna do is move on to the connection of the linkages on the inside of the hull. Uh, just like we did for the rear linkage for the pitch control. All right, here is the completed rear rudded rudder linkage. Um, now I modified that adapter in there, that threaded adapter. I cut it a little bit shorter, uh, both on the threaded end and the open socket end there, just because it is tight for room in the back, but we still got full functionality for adjustment. You can see how the linkage exits in that back area there 
you've got enough throw that that slot is long enough so that you've got throw in both directions so this should work uh, really well you know one of the advantages of these magnetic linkages is you've got the ability for them to move and bend a little bit um, but still remain very secure so there are our linkages both for the tilting propeller and for the rudder I got the rear section uh, bolted down that's all set to go um, really what we're going to move on to now is uh, putting on some lenses for the salon area and alligator eyes. Okay, we are going to be moving on to creating the lenses for all of the floodlights in the model and to create those we've supplied uh, these Google eyes. Now I know some of you may be thinking that this is a little bit uh, cheesy or, or, or cheap, but these actually form perfect lenses. Um, you do not want to have a perfect uh, sphere or, or hemisphere. Uh, these need to be um, you know narrow or shallow and the model was designed to accept these and once they are cut and put in place they look gorgeous. Now the only issue with this is that you need to cut every single one of these Google eyes out individually and uh, the tool for the job for that is a hobby knife with a fresh blade. Uh, real important you want to have a very sharp blade for this. I'm going to illustrate the technique for this uh, because it does take a little bit of uh, finesse. All right, we're going to start with uh, you know these big ones. You need four of these. Now, hopefully, you're going to be able to see this. Um, the easiest way to do this is to insert the blade right next to the white backing uh, and then you just press down and you roll it down and roll it and continue that all the way around until you're done. And that's it. One lens is now complete. Now the smaller ones uh, are a little bit more picky um, but it's the same technique. Insert the blade right behind the backing there. Just press down, roll the lens around as you go. And there you go. Another one done. So you got to do this uh, for a lot. And what I actually like to do is uh, take some masking tape. And I'm going to stick it to my sheet right up there like this. And then as I go, I'm going to press these down, um, upside down. So the outside face is stuck to the masking tape. And this will be apparent why we're doing that in a little bit. So I'm going to leave that to you. Um, cut up all your lenses, stick them to the masking tape, and we'll move on to the next step. All right, here is a quick look at the finished parts. So you can see I've got them stuck down. I got them on my little painting sheet and I've hit them with two coats of matte clear on the inside, not the outside, on the inside. Uh, so two coats. Now these are gonna be ready for installation. All right, here we go. All of the lenses are in place. You can see how nice and bright those LEDs are. It's gonna be a great benefit for running this thing at the pond day or night. Um, I'm going to disconnect the power here so you can see what this looks like. These are all just press fit into place and then uh, just a little drop of thin CA glue was put in there. For these larger ones because they fit a little bit on the inside I just mixed up some five minute epoxy, spread it around the bottom, dropped them in and those are locked down completely. So all of our lenses are now in place. I've got all of the salon areas and don't forget your alligator eyes up at the top there. I like the way that these look because you can still see that bulb in the middle just like it would be if it were a real submarine. If you don't want to see that, um, obviously you can put some more flat clear over the top or even tint it if you'd like um, to offer you know yellow or blue tint to those floodlights. 
Okay, before we consider this rear section done, I wanted to show the installation of uh, a bit of a safeguard mechanism. Uh, I installed some wheel collars on this shaft and uh, what they are basically are stops that will stop the linkage from traveling too far and allowing the propeller to impact the hull. Now, uh, this is a mechanical version of uh, you know this linkage stop, uh, but you can also do it via software. Uh, our VEX radios allow you to set servo travel uh, so that it will never go beyond. Uh, this particular build is going to be using a Futaba radio system, and as such, uh, I have elected to install some mechanical stops. But uh, again, just standard wheel collars, and I sliced into the bottom. Uh, so that I could slip it over without having to uh, take everything apart in there. So we just notch out one side, drop it on, tighten it down, and you can fully adjust the travel of your linkage. So that's just a safeguard mechanism to make sure that it does not impact uh, at the top or at the bottom of its travel. All right. This next section is going to pertain to the setup and installation of the watertight cylinder. So this is the cylinder that we recommend for use with the model. Uh, it's also used in the German Type 212 and Seawolf models. You got about a four inch battery section, a four inch ballast tank, uh, and about a seven inch electronics uh, module section in here. So this particular build uh, is going to include an automatic pitch controller. I'm going to use the uh, KMC Designs 82. And I'm also going to be installing a 10 amp magnetic mission switch uh, and that is going to replace a mechanical switch which means we don't have to have any punctures in the outside uh, wall of the cylinder. So what I'm actually going to start out with and what I've already done is I've removed this brass or copper pressure vessel. This is more set up for uh, use with the SAS uh, semi-aspirated snort ballast system. Um, I am not going to use that in this particular build. It's going to be ballasted slightly positively. So it's going to be a low pressure uh, pump system. Uh, there's an air pump inside here. So I've removed the uh, pressure vessel, and this is just unscrews from the top, uh, snipped the hoses, and pulled it out the bottom there. So what that does is it gives us additional ballast capacity, uh, reduces the weight of the cylinder. So what we're going to want to do now is we're going to pop open the uh, cylinder itself, get access to the electronics section, and we're going to start installing our receiver and pitch controller. All right, we're going to be going at this uh, somewhat systematically. We'll get the easy things out of the way first. I have connected the two servos for rudder and pitch control to the appropriate channels, in this particular case, channel one and channel two. I have also connected the electronic speed controller to channel three. And then channel 3 is how the receiver is going to be getting power through the onboard battery uh, eliminator circuit built into the electronic speed controller. Um, what I am going to do now is uh, I am going to splice in two of these servo leads, one from the ballast pump and one from the ballast servo. We've got two different functions, one to vent the tank and one to blow the tank and I want them both controlled off the same stick. So I am simply going to uh, splice these wires in together and it'll be a single connection. All right, we have our splices complete. Um, they're just bare right now, if you can see that right there. So what I'm going to be doing uh, after this, of course, is uh, putting some heat shrink over top of each one of those to make sure that we don't get any shorts or anything. But at this point, obviously, before I do that, I want to test the functions. Uh, I've got the um, uh, blow cycle. You can see the green light on the bottom of the pump lighting up. 
And then when we push in the other direction, the ballast servo um, operates. So that all done, let's get the connections all covered up with some heat shrink and we'll move on to the next step. All right, let's talk about the power aspect uh, of the boat. We're gonna start at the very beginning with the batteries. Uh, I've got a pair of these Vislero 850 milliamp hour batteries. Uh, these are gonna get wired in parallel to give us 1.7 amps of battery power, which should be ample to operate this boat. We got standard RC connections uh, on the ends of these. I've got them stuck together with a piece of two-sided tape. Makes a nice solid battery pack. Uh, I'm going to have an adapter that I've just created from some uh, servo leads. I'm going to splice these together just like you can see I've wired them in there right now. And those are going to go into a 10 amp magnetic mission switch. Now these are actually really cool units. Um, they allow you to turn your model on and off just by swiping a magnet across. There's no exterior punctures uh, in your hull. Uh, and the other benefit is, is there's a resettable 10 amp fuse inside so you don't need to have a separate uh, fuse or fuse holder in the model. So I'm going to go ahead and charge these batteries up, make sure that they are all topped up for testing purposes. Uh, I'm going to start soldering the leads to the board and I'll take it from there. Alright, here is the completed magnetic uh, mission switch. The uh, power leads are in place. They come off of the one side of the unit and the main lead going into the rest of the cylinder is on the other side. Uh, the unit comes with heat shrink. I've put that on there to make sure we don't have any shorts. So our power uh, distribution relay is now complete. Um, next step is going to be to feed this wire through the inside of the ballast tank through the brass tubing that uh, runs through the center of it. So we'll feed it from the battery compartment through the ballast tank into the electronics compartment. Okay, I have threaded the power through the ballast tank into the electronics uh, section here. This is where it exits out and I've connected a mini Dean's connector to it. There's two things that need power uh, in the electronics compartment. There is the air pump and the electronic speed controller. So what we're going to do is uh, splice those two requirements together like that. Um, connect the male end of this Dean's connector so that we can plug everything in. All right, I have everything hooked up and I've attached uh, power leads in here so that we can test the functionality. Um, looks like everything is working. We have our pitch control. We have our rudder control. We have our speed control. And we have our pump control, or ballast control. So with that being the case, we can move on to the next step of installing our automatic pitch controller. All right, I've installed my pitch controller and basically it's a it's really easy installation. You've got a lead that plugs into channel two of your receiver and then you've got some pins that will allow you to plug in your servo on the bottom. And uh, as you can see, the way that this works, I've got the uh, servo lead or the um, linkage out the, the back there. As the model goes through a, a pitching moment, the unit corrects by adjusting the pitch output in the back. And you can override that at any time utilizing your transmitter. So it's a really slick uh, unit. There's no fail safe in this particular unit, um, but it's got a lot of functionality that you can set up, including uh, setting your zero pitch and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna go about mounting that right now. Okay, I have my 
um, pitch controller installed. Uh, elected to go along the side of the unit here. I used some two-sided tape as well as a zip tie to keep it completely locked in place. There's instructions for setting up your pitch controller that come with the kit. Um, the big thing to note is that I like using uh, sensitivity setting two. Three is too sensitive and one is not sensitive enough uh, in my experience, but play with it. Uh, it's easy to change. So uh, press and hold it for a couple seconds, let go, look for the two blinking red lights and you will be at the appropriate setting. So since we are uh, calibrating all of this stuff right now, let's go ahead and set up our um, electronic speed controller. And that's a nice simple process as well. We're going to power on and within a couple of seconds you need to press uh, the setup button on the electronic speed controller. So with that done you go full forward, full reverse, and you're done. So it is now noted what full throttle forward is and what full throttle reverse is. There we go. As easy as that. Okay, the next thing that we need to do is set up our receiver antenna. Now, for ideal reception, you're going to want this stretched out as long as possible, and it's extremely hard to do inside the uh, cylinder there. So what we're, we've got is this external antenna that's all built into your cylinder. Uh, and this runs through the bulkhead and it comes to a stud on the inside of the cylinder. The big thing that you need to do is ensure that the length of the antenna after we do all of these splicing is exactly the same as it was before we started to do all of the splicing. So and now in this particular case the um, receiver antenna is too long. The, the uh, extension is too long. So the good news is what we'll do is we'll start from the inside. Um, this receiver is going to float on the inside of the cylinder kind of like this. And so with that being the case, I'm going to take a nice comfortable length and I'm going to cut it off here, strip it, and attach it to that stud. All right, I have attached the receiver antenna to the stud. Now what we're going to continue to do is place the receiver antenna along the length of the stud through the bulkhead, pin it to this wire, and pull it all the way down. Now what we've got is a perfect measurement for where we need to cut the extension for the receiver antenna. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then the last thing that we want to do to ensure that no water forces its way down the inside of this wire is put a little bit of heat shrink on the end of the unit, uh, pinch it nice and tight. All right, I have gone ahead and slipped everything inside the cylinder. You can see it fits nicely. Uh, everything is secured except the receiver. It's floating uh, in there. What we want to do at this point here is uh, mark the location of the bulkhead on the end because of course it's important because your ballast tank is locking the main cylinder body down. Uh, and this end cap can rotate depending on how you install it. So what we want to do is make sure that we've got our orientation correct by putting the unit in the model uh, and then marking uh, or sorry twisting this until it's in perfect alignment and then once that's done I like using this uh, file or you can also use uh, you know your Dremel but you just run it into the end cap and then score the wall of the cylinder. And what that gives you is a mark that will never wear off and it will always let you know exactly where you want to be. And I just run a marker over it so it's easier to see. And you've got an alignment marking that will never go away and always allow you to have perfect alignment between your end cap 
and your cylinder. All right, I wanted to make sure that the battery did not shift around inside. So this is our battery pack. And what I did is I, uh, I 3D printed a little bed connected to the, uh, to the end cap there. Uh, and this is going to go in just something like that. It's going to hold it in place nice and securely so that nothing shifts around, uh, messes up my center of gravity or anything like that. And uh, this is just going to drop into the, uh, the cylinder with the magnetic mission switch uh, right on top like that. There we go. Um, again, note the marks that I put on the top to ensure orientation. And there you go. Can't move anywhere, it can't shift anywhere. Nice and secure. Okay guys, what I'm going to show you now is a classic case of uh, working when you're tired. <laughs> what I'd forgotten to do was install the lighting lead. Uh, we need LED lights on this thing and they need to get power from somewhere. So I took my um, waterproof connection uh, lead, did a pass through at exactly the diameter of this rubber sheath. This is all sealed, so there's no way for it to get through. This is um, wicked in with some thick CA through the entire bulkhead. I've attached a miniature Dean's connector to that. And then I'm tapping off of the magnetic mission switch. Here is the female end, and that's right on the directly on the output side of the magnetic mission switch. So I've got to replace the heat shrink uh, on that switch, but once that's all connected together, we'll have uh, power for our lights. So if you're watching this, I'm glad that you watched through the whole thing before you um, started building, because uh, you're gonna need some lights. If not, you gotta backtrack a half a step. It's not a big deal. This literally took about three and a half minutes. All right, let's take a look at uh, some more recent work in here. And this is connecting the ballast system um, outlets uh, and intakes. So we've got two uh, nipples on the bottom of this uh, watertight bulkhead. Um, if you take a look at your air pump, there's an outlet that is directly in line with the center, and then there's one that's off center. The one that's in the center is your output. That's blowing air out. The other one is sucking air in. Now these, uh, just as a, a point of reference, are a diaphragm pump, which means they're just as happy pumping water as they are air. Um, but really, we're, we're going to be pumping air in here. But I'm just my point is, is that it doesn't hurt anything to get a few drops of water uh, sucked through the pump. So taking a look at the end, I've marked everything out, out and in. So if we take a look at the circuit here, water is going to be drawn in from the surface. And I've made a, a little kind of a snorkel, and this actually lines up with the dorsal hatch. So it, it protrudes all the way up um, right level with the top of the deck, because we want this intake to be as high as possible. So the air gets drawn in through there, out the pump, and then it blows out into this fitting and into the ballast tank. Um, there are other nipples on here, and that's if you set this system up for the, the semi-aspirated snort, uh, or SAS system. Um, I've elected not to do that with this because there's not enough room above to mount the float valve. Uh, and it's also safer to do it this way. It'll be ballasted slightly positively, so if anything goes wrong, your boat will always return to the surface. So. The ballast system here is pretty well set up. Now all we're gonna to need to do is cap off these um, little nipples and what I'm gonna do for that, I'm just gonna use little pieces of the hose, put a plug in the end and just slip it right on there. And the last thing that we're gonna to have to do is uh, create a plug to go over the top of this hole that we were left with when we removed the reservoir for the liquid air. Uh, and I'll just use a piece of plastic over the top there, seal it up really well so that no air can escape. All right, let's take a look and see how things uh, are looking here right now. I have a watertight cylinder inside there. I wanted to show you how that valve uh, or the intake looks. So you just pop that up and you can see that little brass intake just uh, probably 3 16 of an inch 
below the hatch level, so it's right even with the upper deck. So as soon as this boat breaches the surface, that pump will have the ability to draw air uh, from the surface and blow it into the tank. So let's take another look inside here. We've got our um, hoses plugged off and I just joined these two together so that's all sealed off. Capped this one off with a little piece of hose and brass. Uh, there is our snorkel. I've run the receiver wire along the entire length of the boat through the drain the, uh, the the hole here and around so it's the entire length of the boat should give us very good um, reception. The other thing that I've done and of course this is completely uh, up to you but I just made a little key uh, for the magnet which is mounted in the end there. Easier to hold on to. Um, it says Nautilus on there so uh, just a kind of a neat uh, key to turn the model on and off. So I'll show you how this all works. Turn our radio on. I'll back up a little bit here. There we go. Uh, just run the magnet in front of the sensor and everything is now turned on. Um, let's check some functions out here. We've got our rudder control. We've got our pitch control. You can see the propeller tilting up and down there. We've got our ballast control. Vent the tank and blow. So we can hear it uh, you know, working hard when I plug that off. So it's drawing air in and blowing it into the ballast tank. And we've got our throttle. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see this all working. Nice and smooth operation. Quiet, no vibration. Um, that's about a third throttle, but you can tilt things forward and back. And at the extreme edges, up and down, it, it does uh, on the inside just rub a little bit, but I'm not worried. That'll, that'll break in over time. Really, really good. I'm kind of excited to see what full throttle in this uh, boat does. I think it's going to move along really, really well. All right, one of the last aspects uh, of the cosmetics that we need to do is installing the salon windows. Um, and because this is going to be an enclosed area, we're going to need to create some drains for it. Uh, one eighth inch drill bit, we're going to need to put a single hole in the very bottom, right in that crease, and then another one at the very top. The bottom one allows water to go in, the top one allows air to go out. So, four holes, two on each side. All right, installation of the salon windows is uh, pretty easy. You just cut out the uh, windows and it's exactly like the wheelhouse that we did earlier. You want about a sixteenth of an inch lip uh, back from that crease. Set it in place and I actually used uh, five minute epoxy. You do not want to use cyanacrylic glue because you are going to wind up fogging the interior. It'll be a white fog that'll be on there. It'll mess up your windows. Epoxy does a great job of putting it in. You can also use clear silicone. Um, your salon frames, you can see that there's a bend near the bottom there. You're going to want to cut that about a sixteenth of an inch down from that mark. Uh, and that'll give you the starting point. You set it in place, uh, trim it, test it, trim it, test it, trim it until you get uh, a really good fit. And again, epoxy works really good. Set it in place, put some masking tape uh, over the top of it just like I did here to hold everything in place as it cures and uh, your windows will be installed. All right, everybody, I think that is going to wrap up this chapter. Uh, basically, the boat is functional. Everything works on it, all of the functions, all of the cosmetic aspects have been addressed. Uh, next step is going to be prepping it for water. So next chapter is going to deal with the installation of ballast, foam, and trimming out the boat for surfaced and submerged operations. So I hope you'll join me. Um, 
If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please do so either by email at bob at rc-sub.com uh, or in the comments section of this video. Thanks a lot, everyone. We will catch you next time.